because we are uh, shooting uh, Chunjiang, please turn on your camera. Yeah, I put uh, get everyone here. Okay, great. Yeah. So yeah, now this uh, is our distinguished guest, uh, you know, yeah, this evening. We have a Chun Jiang from Houston, University of Houston. We have Xu Lin from University of Illinois and Champaign. Uh, uh, and we have Nick, everyone already met Nick. So uh, first I want to, you know, uh, have some questions for you guys, because, you know, we have a large number of audience here. They all were curious about how to be a scientist, how to be a really, you know, kind of such a top scientist, you know, what's the magic here? So first I'm going to ask a question for Nick, because Nick, I say that I know you for 15 years, right? Almost, maybe yes. more than that, you know? Yeah, it's a yeah. long time. But in the last 15 years, you always continuously come out with so many good ideas. Where the from? It's like a fountain, you know, <laughs> spell out always. Yeah, where are you from, all these good ideas? Um, I, I should first say that uh, all those credits goes to my students and uh, uh, many brilliant uh, colleagues. Uh, without them, um, those uh, uh, fascinating ideas would not be possible. Um, uh, I would also add to uh, very important, uh, say, uh, leader and uh, I'll say mentor in my uh, career. That's Professor Xiang Zhang. Uh, uh, in particular, I think uh, 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 I learned one thing very important uh, uh, message from him. Uh, there is no uh, stupid questions. Uh, that's uh, the first uh, uh, encouragement he gave me during, um, say, uh, my early. Uh, days of graduate study. Okay, cool. Uh, Xiu Ling, yeah, so uh, it's really, really uh, great to have you here. So every time I met you, I feel I got some energy, you know, uh, you are so outstanding doing many things and uh, achieve so high, you know, not only in your career, also have, uh, you know, best things for family, for everything. So um, you remember last year in the summer we met at McCall, one 26 years old, you know, PhD candidate is a young girl. He's really nervous about his career and his, her life and all these kind of things at such an early stage. I mean, in the audience, maybe many, many, you know, young generations now is really uncertain for the future, have a lot of worries. So could you give some kind of experience or words for them how to overcome difficulties and get to the bright future? Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Alice, for, for having me. Um, I should say, you, you mentioned the energy, the positive energy. I should say that right back to you. Every time I see you, I hear you, I, I'm absorbing some energy from you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's uh, the question about uh, female scientists. It's a question that's been discussed, debated uh, uh, forever. And when we look at uh, our chart, so every time we have a faculty meeting, I'm, a, I'm in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, we look at the female enrollment in the last four decades. The percentage... Four decades. <laughs> four decades. The percentage hardly ever changed. In, in our area, if you go to a different discipline like bioengineering, that's a different scenario. But in, especially in physical electronics, that's where uh, well, the area I'm in, um, the numbers really, really look bad. Um, so the, the question uh, you posed, and last time we talked about this, uh, uh, I, I don't think there is a answer that's gonna be uh, be a solution to everybody's problem. All I could say is uh, when, when women look at their career path and they have more considerations to actually take into consider to our counterpart. Um, so if you use the, uh, uh, when you solve the equation, you have boundary conditions. We all live within certain boundary conditions in the society. And for women, you have additional boundary conditions. And how do you thrive, succeed, 
and make a fulfilling life and a career within this boundary condition. Um, I, I want to say, based on my experience uh, and my kids, uh, uh, I, I think it's as long as you think outside of the box and you trust yourself uh, without getting too much uh, pressure, taking the pressure is always there. But if you don't let that pressure get to you, just be yourself and you cannot lose yourself because other people told you, you shouldn't do this, you cannot do this. Uh, and you also do not have to follow other people. I didn't start my faculty career until 10 years after I got my PhD. Um, so everybody has their own path. Uh, you follow your heart um, and the try. If you don't try, you never know whether you're gonna get there and you regret you never tried. So yeah, that's uh, what I... <laughs> Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. I, I really, really appreciate that you say that. Don't need to, you know, follow others' paths. You have your own path, right? Don't need to say, you know, others' success in this way, but you have your own way. You should get confidence on yourself, you know. You chose the right things at the right time. I think that's more important. The things you want to do and you can, you know, go forward, you put all your energy there. It's passionate for the girls. I met so many, you know, young girls and uh, they are in the field many times they say okay I, if i miss this kind of a uh, chance maybe i will miss it forever i say no never right <laughs> yeah like uh, professor lee was uh, uh, working in the industry uh, for long term and then you know go back to the universities oh, oh did so good excellent i mean that's very good examples okay Chun Jiang, now it's your turn yeah I'm really, really uh, happy to see you here because you are the youngest one. Yeah, you are like, uh, you know, you remember two years ago, you was in the mind, you know, young scientists or work sessions. I see that you like Rocky. Yeah, you grew up so fast. It was developing your career so well. So that time you win the titles of under 35, right? The scientists are the stars. So now you are a very, very young stars in this field. And could you tell us something about your experience? Why so magic, you know, to be a rising star? <laughs> Ennis, uh, thank you so much for the uh, very kind assessment on me. You know, uh, in our society, and actually in the past few weeks, and also today, we have, you know, there's a uh, distinct speakers and all their resume are very shiny. They have a very kind of fast rising career, a fabulous, you know, a productive career over, you know, from the early stage to as of now. So I, of course, you know, I'll be very happy to share uh, my two cents. So uh, I think especially those two cents are probably uh, for, probably for those young scientists or at early stages starting their career. So I, I think the most important or the, the few most important aspect is first try to find a good problem to work with. And, mm -hmm. you know, find a problem that you probably can look into the big challenges in the field. And you work on those problems not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And of course, you know, work on those hard problems, you also need to match with your scientific background. And also uh, constraints or boundary conditions is that to get them funded. And don't just, don't just simply choose or chase hot topics. And, uh, you know, once you work on those problems, you can publish solid, rigorous results, and you can build your own credit in the field. So I think uh, once you find a good problem to work with, and uh, you're going to be persistent. And the hard problem, you're going to see a lot of challenges. So once you see those problems, encounter these challenges or problems, don't simply give up or don't get distracted by you know, hot topics, by finding those uh, different aspects. And of course, you know, all everything uh, work it out coming from hard work, hard work from you know, as, the, uh, as the principal investigator, as you know, leading a team to motivate your team members work things uh, out. So that's uh, my uh, two cents. Okay, great. That's exactly, you know, uh, what I wrote 
uh, years ago, when you are young, you must choose the most challenging way, the path. So I choose the most challenging questions to challenge yourself to do something, you know, make yourself, uh, you know, uh, outstanding. Thank you for, you know, yeah, suppose this. I fully agree. Yeah, it is a great, a great. So I'm so happy we have this uh, first I can add the dialogue on the screen. I see we want to deliver the message to all the audience and uh, the people so who may, you know, see all these videos later. So see that we're going to share more. We're going to share technologies and all this experience and many, many, you know, good things uh, I can add talks. So yeah, thank you so much. I see Chun Jiang now is your turn to introduce Professor Xiu Lin. Yeah, you are guest host. So now stage is yours. All right. So great. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. So uh, today it is my great honor to introduce Professor Xu Ning Li from the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. So Professor Li is currently the uh, Donald Bigard Winnet Professor in Engineering in the uh, Department of Engineering, Electrical and Computer Engineering. And also uh, she is currently the Interim Director of the Nick Honoyak Jr. Micro and Nanotechnology Laboratory at the University of Illinois. She obtained her BS degree from Peking University in China and then a PhD degree from UCLA. She joined the uh, uh, University of Illinois in uh, 2007. So she had a very prolific and uh, acronoid uh, winning career. She published hundreds of papers, holds many patents. Her research has been recognized by many awards, such as those very prestigious like NSF Career Award, DARPA Young Faculty Award, and Office Naval Research Young Investor Award, etc. So she's a fan of, of IEEE, APS, and OSA. And without further ado, Professor Ni, the stage is yours. Thank you, Professor Yu, for that very generous introduction. I and I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Zhang one more time for inviting me. Um, let's see if I can share my screen here. So my, my screen, that's my title page, okay. Um, and it, it's a great honor for me to, uh, to speak um, uh, at this uh, huge forum. And uh, Professor McFan is a hard act to follow, but I'll try my best. So the title of my talk, if I can move this out of the way. Um, so again, I, I'm from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, UIUC, um, and the, uh, I'm faculty in the Granger College of Engineering Department, Micro, uh, Department Electric and Computer Engineering. The research lab, uh, my research is that uh, it, it's the uh, ad is uh, called Nikoniak Micro and Nanotechnology Lab. Um, Nick mentioning his talk, uh, Honiak actually is the inventor of the practical LED, the, uh, the red LED was invented by Nick Honiak. Um, so our building is actually named after him. Um, so today I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about nanofabrication. Uh, that, that's the theme for, for today, the nanofabrication. I'm going to use a couple of examples to, to see, uh, to show you how we use uh, nanofabrication to change electronics, photonics, and about medical research. That's a huge title. Of course, I won't be able to, to actually uh, transforming that, uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, the, the spirit and it's the approach I want to share with you. Um, before I go to the technical part, uh, this is the most important slide I need to acknowledge my students who did the work. Um, so on the very left is the current group members that includes um, um, students uh, and undergrad students. Um, and 
founding agencies are listed in the middle and senior authors, uh, senior collaborators uh, and their students and postdocs uh, uh, worked with us uh, um, to enable all these research. Um, I also put down the list of uh, PhD thesis students and postdocs sponsored in my group and their current affiliation. So most of my students go to semiconductor industry uh, with one exception, um, the second person actually, Karthik Balasandram, became a lawyer um, after P PhD. Um, my postdocs, uh, uh, most of them go to universities to become uh, faculty members uh, worldwide. Um, so it is the collaboration among the students and between groups uh, on our campus uh, across the uh, um, other campus and, and globally that made this research uh, happen. So the goal of our research is to address the ever-present need to reduce size, weight, power, and the cost. We want the devices to be as small as possible. We want, uh, we want it to be light. Um, we want to consume as less power as possible. We also want to have more power uh, on the de device. At the same time, it cannot be too expensive. To achieve all these goals at the same time is always challenging, but that's the dream. We want to make things small, light, and uh, use less energy. There are many ways to, to approach that problem. In my group, what we do is we make nanostructures. Um, there are different ways to make nanostructures. You can build it from uh, bottom up by adding atom by atom. You can also do it from top down by removing materials to make nanostructure. Um, you can use different materials and what's different structure. The goal is to enable new device concepts that can beat the state of art. At the same time, we also cannot forget the fundamental side of all this research. We need to discover new science and innovate to uh, engineer all these devices and systems uh, um, to, to, to bring real changes. Um, I listed several keywords here. Uh, for our approach, when we make nanostructures, so this is a nanofabrication talk, so I'm not I'm gonna focus on the, the fab part. Uh, the keywords here are damage-free, especially when we remove materials, so you are damaging the material to remove part of it. So we want to strive to be as little damage as possible. And the method we use needs to be compatible with the existing method. And also it must be scalable in order to be practical. Um, we cannot graduate a student, graduate a student uh, with one nanowire or one quantum dot. They need to be uh, an array and need to bring real changes. Uh, um, so that, that's our keywords we keep in mind. Um, we have um, three threats in, in my group right now. Um, the first one is what I call the bottom-up nanotechnology. So we use the epitaxial growth method to grow three, five compound semiconductors. Um, this method is called MOCVD. My group's uh, website actually starts with MOCVD, so mocvd.ec.illinois.edu. Um, MOCVD stands for Metal Organic Chemical Vapor Deposition is the growth method that made your face uh, recognition camera on your iPhone. So that's uh, how we uh, grow Vixel for face recognition. Um, so to do this from bottom up, and that gives you the nanowires and nano uh, quantum dots and all these uh, different nanostructures, uh, uh, because they're not planar, you can do 3D electronics, and because it's nano, you can actually easily integrate it heterogeneously, not on the same substrate, which will be homogeneous. Uh, with a smaller size, uh, it's more forgiven um, for string accommodation. So that's the bottom-up aspect. And um, the second thrust in my uh, group is the top-down nanotechnology, and that's the part I'm gonna talk about today. The first part of my talk, uh, it's uh, it has an acronym called the MACETCH. I'm going to tell you what that that stands for, 
And I'm also going to show you why I, uh, I'm claiming this is not your ordinary edge. And the third thrust in my, my group is uh, the combination of top-down and bottom-up nanotox technology. And particularly, we have a, a membrane-based technology. Um, it's similar to a 3D MEM platform, but it's self-assembled. And we use that to change um, miniaturized passive electronics uh, uh, to integrate the photonics and also developing um, biomedical uh, techniques uh, to advance human health. And the images I'm showing on the bottom next to each of the pillar of these uh, research is examples uh, of the, the, uh, the structures, the devices we made using bottom up. That's a 3D uh, nanowire hemp structure, high electron mobility transistor structure. And the middle one is uh, a array of the silicon wires that has an aspect ratio of 100 to 1. I'm going to get into details of that part uh, uh, in the next few slides. And the third image showing there is uh, a rolled up uh, inductor that's orders of magnitude smaller than the state of art. All right, so with that, I'm going to start my uh, first topic, um, MAC edge. Um, when you say edge, you remove materials. There are different ways to remove materials. And I'm going to show you how we remove materials. Um, so showing on this slide, and I have a cross-section view of a piece of silicon. If you live on planet Earth, you have silicon with you. Uh, most of you have silicon, uh, carry silicon in your phone, in your laptop, um, uh, almost any electronics, your refrigerator. Somewhere the control electronics has silicon. This method applies to silicon. It also applies to many other semiconductors. I'm just going to use silicon as example to illustrate this. So on top of silicon, I have this gold colored uh, uh, illustration that represents metal. Um, the metal is patterned. You can pattern it with any lithography or even just the, the disperse on, um, to the semiconductor surface. And under the right condition, wherever you have the metal, it's going to remove the material underneath. And wherever you don't have the metal, the material stands as is. So now you have a structure that's 3D. You remove the materials when you, wherever you have the metal. So just repeat this process, and here's the flow. You first pattern the metal, then you put this wafer with the metal already on it in a mixture that consists of HF and the peroxide. That's for silicon. If you're working with gallium arsenide, that's going to be a different solution. So pattern the metal, immerse into a solution. There you go. Your etching takes place directly underneath the metal. And this, in comparison to the conventional wet etching without metal, where wet etching normally happens in all directions. So that's isotropic. That means it etches, say, one micron deep. It's going to etch to the left one micron, to the right one micron. So you're not going to get very, uh, very high aspect ratio structure with that. So in order to get high aspect ratio structures, you will have to use something called a dry edge, reactive ion etching, ICP, reactive ion RE, all these uh, KB and the different kind of dry edge. These dry edge mostly involves plasma, high energy ions, that's going to damage your crystal. So if you want to grow these materials, uh, the, the, the pillars, the wires I'm showing here, you can use the bottom up goes uh, like an MOCVD I, I mentioned, uh, such as the vapor, liquid, solid, goes method. And here's the illustration. But this method requires a reactor. In comparison, the method I showed you with metal on top of semiconductor is a wet chemical edge, but it's anisotropic. And that is what MAC edge is. It stands for metal assisted chemical etching. 
So from now on, I'm just going to say MACET uh, instead of uh, saying the, the entire phrase. And it is entirely scalable um, because the patterning method is already well established. 12 inch silicon wafer, you can pattern and make all kinds of uh, 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 integrated circuits uh, chips. Uh, the throughput is quite high. You can actually remove several microns per minute, and the cost, the low cost factor is obvious. All I need is a wafer with the pattern on it and put in the solution, and that, that's how, how you etch. You really don't need the uh, expensive infrastructures. Um, so that's a very high level um, introduction of what Mac etch is. Uh, what I illustrated on this slide right now is uh, how do you generate different patterns? Say I want array of pillars, um, which is the image on the right. Those are actually um, uh, SEM images. So in order to produce that, I take a mesh, metal mesh, and uh, going into a mac -etch solution. And this mesh will sink below the surface and, and leave behind the pillars. And if you want to produce an array of holes, you start with dots, then each dot will sink all the way. As long as you leave it in the solution, it's gonna to continue to sink if you can control the condition. The challenge is uh, all this, the dots are gonna sink at the same rate, and those are the things that we, we do our research on. And if you want a array of sheets, fins, you're gonna actually open slits, then sink those in. So literally you take whatever pattern you have, you let the pattern drop into the body of your semiconductor, leave behind the structure you wanted. So that's that uh, illustration of a uh, different kind of uh, pattern. Um, there are many uh, really unique characteristics of Mac Edge, and here's the most obvious one. It is a method that can produce extremely high aspect ratio structures. And this is the same image I showed before, it's a silicon, um, wire array, um, 550 nanometer diameter. So it's not quite nano, but we do have examples that, that goes all the way down to five nanometer. Um, putting the solution for 20 minutes, you get 51 microns tall. So that, that is um, the highest aspect ratio um, we, we show, showed in this paper. I should have the reference on, on the bottom uh, here. Um, you can now do this with RIE. Um, then the question is uh, extremely high. So how high is it? How far can you go? Um, so here's my claim. The aspect ratio in principle is infinite. So what the reason is the metal catalyst which enables the etching is sitting at the bottom of the bottom of this interface. So as long as this interface continues to drop, you're gonna have um, uh, tall wires and that gives you infinite uh, aspect ratio. Uh, when I say in principle, there must be a in practice um, side of this. Uh, in practice, it's hard to keep this interface uh, forever. So you actually have uh, um, a limit, not that's uh, less than infinite. So what's the mechanism? The mechanism is also quite simple. We, this is a solution-based reaction and you don't need a closed circuit. It's an open circuit reaction, but you have a metal, you have a semiconductor. The metal actually acts as a cathode and the semiconductor silicon in this case acts as an anode. And that's the reaction I listed here. And the peroxide, which is the oxygen here, and in the presence of the metal, it generates holes, electronic holes. And that hole will re the react with the anode, that silicon, and oxidize silicon to silicon oxide. And in the solution of HF, silicon oxide will be gone. And to illustrate how this actually happens is the, um, the schematic um, on the bottom. Um, so I have um, the catalyst sitting on top of silicon and generate holes and change that to oxide. Sorry, go back. Um, then HF removes that. You can see how it's removed. It actually has to go around the catalyst and remove the oxidized the semiconductor. 
And once this is completely gone, the catheters continue to drop, and that's how you etch. And this is a local electrochemical reaction. No, uh, you don't need any equipment. In order to do electrochemistry, you have to do, have a closer circuit and, and with a potential stat and change your current density and etch. Um, in this case, it's uh, dipping the solution and locally you have the, um, the, you, you have the electrodes um, to perform this um, electron hole uh, exchange. Um, so what I showed you so far is all wires. And this is an example of a um, via structure. Um, I can change the via size by e-beam lithography. And in this case, we changed the, the diameter from 100 nanometer to 200 to 300, then sink the dots into silicon and produce these vias. Um, so one of the questions we want to address is what's called loading effect in etching. How does the etchery change as a function of size? So what I showed in this plot here, the x-axis is um, diameter and the vertical axis is etch rate. And let's see how the etch rate changes. It's not linear and it's not flat. The ideal world will have, is a minimum loading effect, no difference, no matter how big is your hole. But in this case, what we observed is a parabolic re relationship. As the diameter increases, the etch rate increase initially and reach peak, then start to drop. And this can be actually pretty well explained by the mechanism, the underlying mechanism of MACH, which involves two aspects. First, you have to generate the carriage, generate the host in order for the oxidation to, to take place. Second, once the semiconductor gets oxidized, you have to remove it before the next oxidation reaction can take place. So that's what I call the mass transport. Carrier generation, mass transport. And as a function of the diameter, and if you're, you increase the diameter, um, the uh, carrier generation uh, rate increases because you have more catalyst. But after certain size, it's gonna be limited by mass transport, not by carrier generation, because the liquid has to go through the edge of your dot in order to get to the center. And that slows the reaction down. That's why you have a peak. So how do you defeat the loading effect is something we're actively researching on. And uh, what I just pulled up, this image is a, a piece of a four inch wafer. So that means it's uh, the thickness is 550 micron. And using MACH, you pattern, you leave it in the solution, it's gonna drill through the entire wafer. Um, so it's, it's, this picture was taken by a student uh, holding um, the piece with a pair of tweezers. So that's how, how powerful MAC edge is. So what I showed you so far is single crystal um, silicon. And, but in, in a lot of applications, especially memory, you actually need polysilicon. Um, whatever recipe you already worked out for polysilicon actually doesn't, uh, for single uh, crystal silicon actually does not always work for poly. So what I showed here, um, the first image is I have but the optimized recipe, I, when I put it on poly, it gave me very messy uh, etching. So I had to retune this in order to bring back the order. And that's the middle image. Well, so here's what the illustration, um, the, the plots uh, illustrate the etchery dependence um, uh, comparing single crystal with polycrystal. Obviously, they're both going up as a function of size, but the peak is at different position. So with that, you have to adjust your, um, your composition in order to, 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 to actually make polycrystal work. The reason polycrystal doesn't work the same way as single crystal is because of green boundaries. And also different doping concentration, you're gonna to have to use a different recipe. Um, in order for the large dots to work, we actually came up with a, a, a different aspect of MACH, uh, abbreviated as stack MACH, that stands for self-anchored catalyst. In this case, we're not using solid gold. We're actually using porous gold to anchor that dot. Otherwise, the dot will drift, and before you get to the depth you need it, it's already drifted sideways. 
Um, so more information can be found, uh, found in this uh, paper I showed at the bottom of this slide. Um, so that's the aspect ratio and how you do different patterns. Um, the, the, I, I want to say is uh, this is a very versatile method. It works for silicon, but silicon industry already know what they, they, they want to do and it works well. There are many other semiconductors that cannot actually have an easy life as, as silicon does. Uh, for example, if you etch silicon, you damage it with RID. You, you can heat it up anew and the damage will be repaired. If you etch gallium arsenide or indium gallium arsenide, and the damage is not easily repaired because there are multiple elements. Um, if the temperature, a kneading temperature is high enough for, um, for arsenic, it's too low for gallium, you keep raising the temperature, it's too high for arsenic, arsenic will leave the surface, you can end up with a, a material that's not the same stoichiometry. So with that, I think this method actually has a lot of potential to other semiconductors. So what I've shown here is uh, an array of uh, gallium arsenide PIN junction. It's a micro LED. And this is done without using RIE. And um, in the inset, I'm going to bring you this uh, to, to your attention here. In the inset, it's a zoomed in image of this array. Um, pay attention to the sidewall. It's heavily grooved, and that's not what we want. I'm going to show you how we solve that problem. But before I get off the, the stage, so this is gallium arsenide. We got silicon, we got gallium arsenide, and it works for ingas. I'm gonna show you an example of that. It works for indium phosphide, gallium nitride, silicon carbide, gallium oxide. It works on single crystal, polycrystal. Uh, there's a group in Japan demonstrated it works for, for amorphous uh, uh, silicon also. Um, I showed you PN junction here, and you can do hetero junction using this method. When you change material, change doping, change the head of the junction, um, you will have to re-optimize the recipe, but the principle doesn't change. It's carry generation and uh, mass transport and how you control that to make sure you get the right structure. Um, here's another aspect of MacEdge. We use metal as the catalyst. So in this case, the image I'm showing you is the gallium array and after etching and that metal sits somewhere on the bottom and depends on what structure you have. It can sit by your quantum bar. It can sit by your cladding layer of a laser. Um, what we're showing in this, um, thing, this work is that this pillar with the assistance of plasmonic, and it actually funnels the light that we can actually enhance optical transmission. And depends on the height, it depends on the diameter. The, optical transmission wavelength change, change, changes. In this particular one, we, uh, we optimize it for uh, mid-infrared, uh, around seven micron transmission. It transmits more light than planar gallium arsenide. Think about this. I block part of this substrate with a metal mesh. I trans, uh, transmit more light than a planar gallium arsenide. So, the physics is in the paper itself. Uh, this is the power of uh, uh, MacEdge. So that's gallium arsenide. Um, there, uh, there's also indium gallium arsenide and you change the indium composition all the way, you can change to indium arsenide. And what I uh, have here is a 53% indium gallium arsenide going on indium phosphide that's lattice matched. In this case, when we finished etching, what we notice is the surface is actually porous. That is not going to be good for any interface trap density. If you want to make a transistor, make, make a, um, for radios, for even photonic devices. So what we did was we did one or two cycles of digital etching. We oxidize and remove. Um, then the surface became uh, really smooth. And we actually proved the, after that digital etching, the surface um, versus the planar surface before etching and have very comparable interface trap density. So it works for ternary in gas also. And the question I wanted to, to answer to this work was uh, how come sometimes you get poor structure, sometimes you don't? 
And in the system of gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide, and indium arsenide, look at this plot here. And for gallium arsenide, I hardly ever get in porosity. But for indium arsenide, um, often I get a lot of porosity. Good thing is only on the surface. But once I increase the indium composition, if it's indium arsenide, it's very hard to get non-porous structure. And this work actually illustrates a very important aspect of MACH. We have a metal, we have a semiconductor, that's your semiconductor metal junction. And if it's a shocky barrier, like a gold down gallium arsenide, and you have a shocky barrier about 0.9 EV, and once the holes are generated, catalyzed, um, the, the dissociation of the oxidant, and the holes will be trapped because there's a potential barrier over here. But if it's indium arsenide and you have an omic contact and that carrier generated will not be trapped there. So the carrier will diffuse to all places and so you, you, know, you do not have a spatially controlled etching. So this mechanism, which is attributed to shocky barrier controlled distribution of holes is very important. So in, when you work with a new semiconductor, you have to figure out what is your shocky barrier and what is the chemistry there. The bottom line is you need to figure out a chemi chemical reaction that does not etch your semiconductor without the metal. Then wherever you have the metal actually catalyzes the reaction so you can do spatially defined etching. So um, that, that is uh, the etching of um, um, forward direction. So if I want to say forward is, uh, so the illustration on the lower right on this slide is uh, when I have metal, forward means the metal sinks. And what I'm going to show you, uh, the next few examples is inverse etching. I have metal, but wherever I have metal actually doesn't etch. This serves as a mask, but it's a catalytic mask. Let me show you what's the advantage here. So here's the mask in this SEM, that's in phosphide with the platinum on top. It etched in between and going under. And these are the images produced by this method. Um, if you remember that image I showed you on the gallium arsenide PIN micro LED structure, the side walls uh, are rough, completely grooved. That is because the metal pattern itself has edge roughness. For that particular one, we use the method which is the lifting off the metal and that edge is extremely rough. In order to get around the metal edge roughness, I really have to go around the metal. And so that's this inverse etching. We were able to produce extremely smooth surface and, but the disadvantage is it, the, the aspect ratio is limited because the metal sits on top, doesn't go down like when I was illustrating the infinite, potentially in, infinite uh, aspect ratio. But here's why we need this extremely atom, uh, extremely smooth surface. This is an array of indium phosphide with an aspect ratio of 50 to one. If I use RIE to etch this, I won't be able to get the surface as smooth as this. I won't be able to get a surface. So not only the, apparently the morphology is smooth, the stoichiometry maintained, there are no vacancies. You can't see vacancy with, with SEM, but uh, to prove this, we made a, a MOSFET and uh, it, this is the cross section of the MOSFET, one of the fins uh, and um, with uh, high K dielectric and gate metal and the subthreshold voltage, which characterizes the, the off-state leakage, is close to ideal. Ideal number 60 millivolt per decade, there were 63 over here. So that's uh, enabled by inverse MAC edge. Here's another example using inverse MAC edge for uh, germanium. The reason I brought this example up is uh, there's a one, one thing that happens when you do MAC edge, um, What's the surface passive with after you finish etching? Metal sitting on top, your semiconductor that's in contact with, with the metal. But in this case, we actually have an amorphous layer of germanium automatically formed. It's a monolithic self-passivation. And with that, we actually got lower dark current for the photodiode. So the pyramid 
this is the array, and versus planar, which is the blue trace. We have order magnitude improvement on the dark current. That is really important, especially for long wavelength detectors where the noise is, is uh, often a problem. You have to cool down your detector. So having low, lower uh, dark current is, without additional processing steps, you make the pattern, which enhances the uh, photo current because of anti-reflection. At the same time, you improve the dark current by doing this. Um, I have one more example for, for MacEdge. Uh, this is the, the newest compound semiconductor, uh, beta gamma oxide. It has a band gap that's uh, much higher than gallium nitride, which is the workhorse for uh, wide band gap semiconductor for LEDs, uh, high powered devices. Um, on the, the right hand, this chart shows, uh, shows me if I want to increase breakdown voltage, I have to continuously increase my band gap. There's diamond, but diamond has no bulk substrate. The good thing about beta gallium oxide is single crystal. It has, um, I believe, six inch um, substrate is commercially available. For gallium nitride, um, to this day, the bulk substrate is not widely available. Um, so that's the advantage, that's the driving uh, uh, force, the motivation to study this one. Anytime you do uh, come up with a new semiconductor, the community has to, to make devices. Now, how do you etch is the question we want to address. How smooth can you get? What kind of aspect ratio can you get? Do you induce damage? So just want to show you quickly what we do with the gallium oxide. Um, so this is a, a the gallium oxide the structure made by inverse MacEdge. Um, is, I'm going to quickly skim through this, but just to point out the several things I want you to pay attention to. Um, this mesh is platinum, so that's our catalyst. Um, with white bank semiconductor, because the whole, the whole mobility is really small in for, for beta gallium oxide, and literally you, you, you don't have mobile holes. So we actually need external UV light to generate holes to start etching. But what we notice is uh, instead of the, I, I told you inverse edge normally is a smooth surface, but we're getting all these groups. And the groups are actually aligned particularly along the 001 direction. And this is the AFM image of these groups. It's a good anti-reflection coating, um, but it's not smooth. So we want to address this issue. And because it's a, uh, it's groove particularly, it's uh, crystal orientation dependent, we want to study this. For simple structure like silicon, it's tetrahedral structure. For gallium nitride, it's worsite structure. Gallium oxide, beta gallium oxide is monoclinic. And if you look at these axes, uh, A, B, C, and alpha, beta, it's not a symmetric structure. And uh, you, you, it, it actually, it's so crystal orientation dependent that we initially just did two and still vary too much. So we decided to make this pattern and varies every five degree. Um, so in the end, what we figured out is there are mainly three categories of structures we produce um, using um, MacEdge. As here, the detailed analysis of what these different structures uh, um, are by my students, uh, um, uh, Jack Huang, and uh, here's just a few examples of what they actually look like. So after we finish etching, depending on which direction the, this is platinum's uh, catalyst is facing, we get different morphology, different depths. And uh, if you face this direction, um, which is numbered on the previous slide, you get this almost really sharp pyramid structure. And this is a trapezoidal structure. Um, so it's different shape, depends on how, how you aren't your catalyst strip. And what we care about is what's the surface quality and depends on what device we're gonna make and we can target a different uh, orientation. So in the following uh, several um, slides, I'm gonna show you the, the device uh, performance. Um, so uh, this is the Hashaki barrier height characterization. I'm gonna skip this through and this is the, uh, very well behaved Schalke barrier was the uh, near ideal ideality factor. Um, I'm going to skip all this through and just to show you in the interest of time what 
this is compared to, okay, this is slide I want to, to, to stop on. Um, compared to planar structure, the pyramid edge structure, trapezoidal like structure, and the blade, which is this really sharp, sharp one. The interface trap density actually is not any worse. It's actually slightly better after you etch. Think, think about the etching, you're removing material, you're changing the surface. And the fact that we didn't damage the surface is very comforting to know. So we did the characterization using the mass cap instead of a mass bed in this, in this case, but we're working on um, mass, uh, mass bed here. Um, so here's the conclusion of, of, um, of uh, the uh, gallium mass, uh, beta gallium oxide. Um, uh, this is a very new material. And we, for the first time, demonstrated the Mac Edge works for a material that's uh, 4.9 EV in band gap. And the edge rate is still slow, so we're working on that. Um, we actually did confirm there are uh, um, oxygen deficiency, and um, the, but the surface after high K passivation is as good, actually slightly improved compared to the planar structure. Um, here's my conclusion of um, back edge. It defies the textbook definition of chemical etching. It's very high aspect ratio, so it's anisotropic. It could potentially change how electronic devices, uh, um, photonics are, uh, devices are, are made. Um, I mentioned a lot about inverse MAC edge. I did not get to the uh, talk about the magnetic field guided MAC edge. I showed one slide about self-anchored. So there are different aspects of this. What I wanted to show you, because it's a very wide um, uh, audience with different experience, I wanted to show you how we actually discovered this. On this slide, what I showed is how people make pore silicon. What you do is uh, you take a silicon substrate, you put a metal on the back, and that serves as the anode. Then in the solution, you have a platinum electrode that is the cathode. Then you apply anodic bias, positive bias to the back of the silicon and through that you form a closed circuit. So when I was doing this experiment to make spore silicon, um, spore silicon give you uh, red light when you put the shine UV light on it. That particular day, unfortunately, the metal I deposited not only got onto the back, also got on the side and the top corner. And that day, another thing happened. The liquid inside the Teflon cell leaked out. The wafer actually broke. So that's a disaster. Those of you who worked with uh, hydrogen fluoride, that's a huge uh, um, danger. Um, so that's two accidents happened on the same day with this experiment. And uh, after I cleaned up the mess, what happened uh, was I decided to look at a wafer anyway, to look at a wafer using the UV lamp to see what, um, if I made any pore silicon. To my surprise, the corner where it's sitting outside of the speaker is actually brighter than ever. All those time I was trying to make the brightest pore silicon, red uh, emitting silicon, it uh, never beat this part. So I decided to confirm whether metal did anything. So I removed this uh, potential stat. I don't need any closed circuit anymore. All I need is metal and a solution because this part was not part of the circuit. So I was able to confirm metal assisted etching actually made pore silicon better than the ones with a, a anodic bias. Um, from that point on, I just did take a wafer and make patterns. And this pattern can be anything, it can be Chinese characters. When you think this thing, you can make pore silicon if you change the condition and to make, uh, to polish this silicon and that to your etching. The, Spatially resolved etching. So this is document. The results is documented in this paper uh, back in 2000. Before I left the university, went to a startup company. Um, so I just want to use the example to, to 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 confirm what Thomas Edison said. 
just because something doesn't do what you planned it uh, to do, it doesn't mean it's useless. In this case, it's the ultimate serendipity um, for me, and that's how MacEdge was uh, first discovered. It was built on the stain edge, built on previous experiments using aluminum. But those of you who use aluminum to do uh, try the aluminum for, for Mac Edge, uh, it's not going to survive uh, for very long. Um, the uh, Mac Edge widely used nowadays needs a noble metal. You can use gold, platinum, silver, um, ruthenium, the 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 tie nitride, all those. So with that, there was very different. And we have 10 issued patents, uh, several more pending. We have lots of publication on this one. So that's the story I wanted to tell you. All right, now I'm going to switch gear to tell you the second platform. Um, this is a 3D MEMS platform, but we never process in 3D. Everything we do is planar technology. And so we put string stress in that membrane. So once we release it from the mechanical support, it rolls up to a tube or to a cone or to a helical structure, depends on how we pattern it and how we release it. So we have an acronym for that. It's a string induced self rolled up membrane and we use SRAM for short. And this is an illustration how this works. Um, I drew, this is actually from a paper um, by a Russian group uh, and they discovered this first. Um, this is look like a single crystal because I have lab, lab is here, but it doesn't have to be single crystal. So I, the red layer here has a larger lattice constant in, in this illustration. So in order to fit onto the substrate, it has to compress to fit. And the green layer here has a smaller lattice constant, so it has to stretch to fit. So that's where the opposite force here, once you release it from the mechanical support using selective etching, then the red layer doesn't like it anymore. It was compressed to fit. Now it wants to expand to go back to its original lattice constant. But the green layer doesn't want it to do that because green layer needs to have a smaller lattice constant. As a result, you have a momentum. And this momentum will make this membrane roll. And how many turns it roll depends on how much you actually release. How big is the diameter depends on how thick and how much string is embedded in that membrane. So with that, we are able to produce uh, uh, ten, tens of nanometers to over 100 microns. Larger is not a problem. Making this small is really challenging. Uh, so we decided to make devices that uh, doesn't require three nanometer. That's the, another field. Um, so here's that's the mechanism. And just to show you how well these things uh, can, can actually work. This is a simulation done by my former student, Ben Sedan as postdoc. Uh, uh, his name is Wen Huang. He's actually a professor in Hefei University of Technology. Um, so he he led this um, project. Uh, this is the modeling to show how to, how these uh, membranes actually grow, and to the point we can control any fraction of a turn or any number of turns. Um, here's a, the fabricated structure. Um, from a quarter turn to half a turn to three quarter turn and one turn. If you pay attention to this one, we started from one side, we rolled all the way back, and you're supposed to see a seam, but we don't. So he was able to predict this very well and realized that demonstrated this experimentally. And if we want to have tapered, we just have to make uh, the, the stretch here more than the end. If we want to change the diameter to make um, um, almost like a core shell structure is actually transformer to, uh, the prototype. And the inner diameter of the inner tube versus the outer tube, this in this case is exactly half compared to the outer one. All of these can be changed, can be controlled locally across the membrane. And let me give you an example of how we use the three um, um, SRAM for passive electronics. Uh, one of the, the problems that we want to solve is to make the spiral inductor on your chip smaller, leave more space for other uh, uh, functionalities on your cell phone. Uh, and if we make power inductors, that's for uh, the electrical grid. 
and it's pretty obvious. I don't have to, to go through the details. The inductor is huge. It, if you want to increase the inductance, you just spiral more turns. And that is the humongous uh, component we, we want to actually minimize. And not only it occupies more space, it also couples with the substrate more because the, uh, the parasitic uh, capacitance and that uh, gives you all the, um, all, all the loss and interference with PAXA uh, with the other components on your circuits. Um, so here's how we are gonna change the inductive footprint. Instead of spiraling in plane, we want to spiral in the Z direction. So as we finish spiraling, what you see is the metal so this is the metal coil, just like the planar inductor, but we're looking at it from this is the cross section. So we're, this is standing up. What's standing up is the entire tube, but the only thing that's on the surface is this tangent line over here. And these are feed lines for us to land the probe on to test. And the, the, uh, the fabrication here is illustrated uh, in there. We actually use silicon nitride in this case. We have a low, uh, high frequency, low frequency deposition that, that gives us the tensile and uh, compressive stress. And then we pattern our metal on top and release and it rolls. So here are some examples of, uh, of our uh, designs. Uh, these are patterned strips, 2D pattern. Very simple compared to my transistor work because this is so much simpler because it's the micron size. And all in 2D, you pattern your deposit metal once you release, these are your inductors. And it depends on how many strips you, you need and uh, that changes. So this is two, four, six. So the inductance actually just doubles and triples over there. Here's a cross section image. So these are the coils and in between the coils is insulator and that's like a nitride and that's uh, transparent there. Compared to planar inductors, the tube inductors naturally has a 3D confinement of the field. And that means it doesn't have to, it doesn't interact with the substrate much. And uh, compared to planar ones, it disappears to the substrate and to adjacent components. So that's the advantage. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's the, the performance as a function of uh, number of turns, as a function of number of strips. Um, I'm not gonna uh, stay on this slide for very long. So what I wanna do is actually do this benchmark chart. So what's plotted here is our 3D tube inductor benchmarking against the, the, the inductor on your CMOS chip. So on the CMOS chip, um, the green one represents 2010 technology, the 32 nanometer technology, and the blue one represents the older generation. So this is 3D plot, this is the footprint, and that's the Q factor, and this is the inductance. So for the same inductance, if I go over here, for the same inductance, our inductor is a couple of orders of magnitude smaller. And so what's not so good is the height of these inductors made out of our the SRAM tubes. And so our red bar is lower than the green bar. So our Q factor is low. We have loss. So the, most of the loss comes from the uh, resistive loss. That's because we use 100 nanometer gold and these inductors use 4.5 micron copper. Later on, we did change to copper to improve the resistivity a little bit but it's still far away from uh, what the uh, uh, really thick copper could do. Um, so that's something we're, we're really working on uh, because we can now roll up a 4.5 micron um, uh, metal and still get a smaller footprint. Um, so along that line, so improving Q is one of the, uh, um, the, the goals and the other goal is continue to improve the, power, uh, the inductor um, power. Um, the previous one I showed you was nano Henry. So let's see how, what, how we improve that. And if you remember how we draw these uh, membranes from one turn to another, um, it's continuous. 
So the current direction from one turn to the next turn is actually the same. That means not only we have self-inductance from each coil, we have mutual, positive mutual inductance from each coil, uh, coil to coil. Uh, so if I have more turns, I'm going to have more inductance superlinearly as a function of number of turns. So here, we want to roll up a centimeter long copper strip. And here's the movie, hopefully it'll work. Yep, so looking from the left to the right, we, re we release and we open the edge window. And so the strip is gonna roll from left all the way to the right. And uh, keep in mind that whole length of the strip is a centimeter. And the diameter after I finish rolling of that is less than 100 micron. So that's the image I showed you is when the rolling is not exactly coherent, uh, you see different number of turns over here in, the, in each layer. If you control this really well, you can actually roll, roll this uh, in a very orderly fashion that gives you better mutual inductance. Um, so from a centimeter long strip, after this rolled up, we got a footprint that's three orders of magnitude smaller. So to scale that, we keep increasing the, the length, the, the centimeter long I showed you is this one. We can also increase the number of coils to increase the inductance. So with this strategy, along with other strategies, including core filling from air core to a ferro uh, uh, magnetic core, uh, we are able to increase the inductance uh, for the same frequency much better than the current state of art. So that work is uh, reported recently in science events. So if we can make one inductor, we can make two, we can make 10. The advantage here is we can, we can make all of those on the same plane, on the same plane by lithography and metal deposition in one step. So here I'm gonna show you a transformer. And here's the planar layout. I have a primary, the red coil, I have a secondary, the yellow coil, all these pattern design is one step. Then once I release, it's going to roll up and the primary and secondary will be nested inside of each other. So that's the transformer. And the transformer, so we make these, uh, it's a parallel process that uh, yield is one thing we have to pay attention to. Uh, there are lots of uh, little tricks we improve in nanofab. Those of you who do fabrication, you, you know what I mean. Um, uh, so if it doesn't yield like this one, and that's uh, because it's detoured. And so in this case, this one did not yield, everything else did yield. And here's the SEM, colored SEM image to show you what these transformers look, uh, actually look like. Primary, secondary coil, these are just uh, ground and feed, uh, the feed line and the ground uh, for, for uh, us to test. So that's um, the transformer work. Um, just want to point out some uh, really interesting trend in terms of how we scale the turns, the number of turns in this uh, uh, turn ratio there in the transformer. So a transformer, the figure of merit is uh, uh, related to the magnetic coupling coefficient K over here. And it's uh, proportional to the number of turns. So in order to make a a better transformer, you want to increase the number of turns. Uh, um, for traditional transformer, when you increase the number of turns, turns ratio right here, the magnetic coupling actually becomes weaker and weaker. This is not too hard to, to imagine. I imagine you have a primary that's much bigger than your secondary. When you increase the turn ratio, that means the difference between the primary and secondary is going to be even bigger. The coupling obviously is going to be less because less overlap. In our case, because we nest primary and secondary inside each other, our magnetic coupling actually increases as a function of turns ratio. So we completely defy the conventional scaling trend of turns ratio, and we proved that we, we could do this. Uh, the, in this particular work that's reported, uh, um, I believe it's in Nature Electronics, um, uh, we only had uh, less than three, uh, actually three some turns. Uh, um, so this is a work in progress. Um, the message here is we have better index uh, performance, but with a very simple fab process. Everything's done in 2D, we roll it up all together. 
we can also do multiple uh, inductors uh, for the transformer. I'm going to end this one, end this part of the talk with a biological application. So what I show here is a glass slide. So when you grow neuron cells, any kind of biological cells, you uh, in a lab, um, you put these cells on the glass slide. The experiment we did here in collaboration with the biomedical group uh, in Wisconsin is uh, we put our silicon nitride tubes, the rolled up tubes I showed you before, in this case with our metal, on the glass slide, and we watch how neuron cells grow. And here's a movie. Um, in this movie, you see this is a tube, that's a tube, but there's something going through the tube. And once it finds the tube, it goes in and it comes out. And we're going to play in again and goes out, goes in and comes out. So we actually align the, tube, uh, the neuron cell goes. So this is a cortical neuron cell. What you're seeing is the axon of, of the cell, part, part of the cell. The cell body is, um, is the, at the beginning. And so the cell, the axon actively search for and extend the growth process through these tubes. And in, in addition, there's a 20x growth rate increase in the first part of this tube compared to outside of the tube. So this has a significant implication um, to um, a neural disorder. Of course, we're doing this on glass slide, not in real uh, 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 lab, uh, in lab, not in, in clinic, uh, but it's, uh, it's one of those promising uh, platforms that could be used for, for biomedical research. So I think uh, the time's uh, almost uh, up. Uh, I want to conclude. Um, what I showed you is the MacEdge platform and the SROM platform. I did not have time to, to talk about MOCVD. I actually have, uh, uh, when I was in industry, I worked uh, on MOCVD for, for six years for commercial products and some R&D also. Um, so when we do nanofabrication, which is a lot of people um, perform nanofabrication, what matters is what kind of functionalities, new functionalities you actually give the fabrication platform you created, you innovated. Um, again, I wanted to uh, mention performance is what you target, but to develop a nanofab platform, you have to be able to, to say, this is a controllable one, it's not a one shot thing, it's uh, scalable and it's compatible, compatible with ex existing technology. If you want to uh, have a completely new platform, which is still possible, but replacing existing technology is always hard. You have to find your niche market in order to, to actually uh, make that work. All right, so I'm gonna stop here and put out my acknowledge the, um, the slide again. And thank you very much for listening. All right. So Professor Lee, it's really a wonderful talk. Thank you. So we're gonna have a couple of uh, questions. All right. So I think uh, uh, Anne is gonna show me the uh, questions. Yes, here it is. All right, great. So. First of all, you know, uh, we actually have more than half a million of audience. This is really, really amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are those robots? <laughs> <laughs> they are not, they are not. Yeah. The first yeah. question come out. Tunjian, can you see that? Uh, yes, so hold on. Kind of uh, don't see the screen yet. I think now it's coming. No, I can see. All right. So the first question. So this is uh, Gu from uh, National University of Singapore in U.S. So is the uh, MacCatch method is universal to uh, different crystal materials? And what about the amorphous materials? 
Um, so let me see if I understand the question. So once the uh, universal to different, so that's the type of material. And the second uh, part is the uh, where the crystallinity, whether it's more for a single crystal poly polycrystal. Um, I, I, I don't want to say it's universal because nothing is really un universal, uh, but it does work for many kinds of semiconductors. What you need to do is find the, the right metal, the right shocky barrier, and the solution that would not attack the semiconductor without the metal. So you can define where to etch with the metal. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a process you have to explore to search for the right process. In terms of crystallinity, um, I mentioned uh, there's a Japanese group that demonstrated the amorphous uh, phase and we demonstrated the poly. Um, it should work for all of them. The mechanism is two sides. Again, the care generation and mass transport depends on how you control these. The crystallinity may or may not play a role in here. It's a, if it's a completely related to carrier generation, you're gonna wait for that. So that, that wouldn't have much dependence there. Great. So Annie is okay. gonna show me the second question. Yeah, the second one. Is okay. All right. So uh, second question is coming from Zihua Xiang from Jinning University in China. So uh, thank you, Professor Li, for the uh, amazing lecture. For MacCatch technology, uh, using metal as a catalyst for an isotropic etching, the structure has a considerable aspect ratio. Is the entire etching performed directly in the end, or is it carved in multiple times? Can the number of etchings be increased at the expense of flatness of the etched wall to further increase the aspect ratio of the materials to be etched? It's a very good question. Um, so the example I showed you in my slide was all one step. So the uh, if uh, I understand the question right, is can you do multiple? If I finish one, say I get 100 to one ratio, can I put it back in the solution, do another 100 to one in the end, I just go multiple of this. Uh, um, here's the thing, in order for this high aspect ratio to continue, whatever already formed cannot be further etched. So all your etching is at the bottom where you, your metal and semiconductor in active, uh, in intimate contact. If the top that already etched continue to etch, you're gonna lose that. Great. So yeah, we're gonna move on the third question. So Anis, can you- uh, Already put it on that, can you see it? Yeah, now I can see. Okay. There's also a de always a delay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's a it's hiding again. So the question. So I'm waiting the question to be sure. Okay. Now, uh, you couldn't see that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can so see the, now. So oh, the okay. question is from Bu from Shenzhen University. So the structure looks pretty attractive with Mac Edge fabrication. Did you try some specific applications based on such controllable and diverse patterns? Okay, um, so the example that I showed you uh, for indium phosphide, we made the MOSFET with uh, with uh, aspect uh, ratio of was this forty to one um, that has the really good off state and I didn't show you the on state, on state is also good. So we have a better on off ratio. So any edge we do, our goal is to make devices that's better than the current state of large. And so we demonstrated that we did, did a photo diode, um, but none of those are commercialized if that's what you're, you're asking. I right. see the potential in compound semiconductor. Now the silicon has a, for the extremely high aspect ratio, uh, one of the questions uh, I often ask myself, who needs a thousand to one aspect ratio? What device would that enable? Um, but I think we found some applications recently. Um, 
So that, that's still possible. Technique you use, it should work as long as you make the interface clean. And that's not easy. So we use optical lithography. We use uh, electron beam lithography. And we even use the STM, which is able to pattern an atomic line. So we collaborated with the Professor Lighting School, who's the expert uh, STM. They drilled one platinum line, which is one atom wide. Because at that time, we were exploring how small a feature can we do. Uh, the so the smallest we did was by EDM lithography, five nanometer. And for the atomic line, the trouble was as we finished etching, we cannot find it anymore. You have to go back to STM to actually look for that, that line. Unless you pattern a lot, it's going to be hard to pattern. And the easiest way, if you look in the MacEdge literature, a lot of people use silver nitrate solution. It forms a dendritic pattern of silver. And that's how those battery people are using that method to create a random array of silicon wires at the anode to improve the lifetime and efficiency there. Great, thank you. Uh, so we're gonna move on to the uh, next question. So Anis, can you uh, show us the question? Uh, yes, already on the screen, you can read it. Oh, okay. I, okay, now here it is. Okay, so this question is from Jiu Shui, T-U-B-S. So, so Jiu Shui want to ask, what is the natural resolution of nanostructures etched from silicon and a kind of nitride using MacCatch? So this is a very similar question compared to the, to the one uh, mentioned that, that whether you can use an inexpensive uh, method to pattern. So with that, I mentioned the smallest uh, lateral resolution we tried and did not find was the ultimate resolution that's one atom width. We didn't find it, but the smallest we demonstrated reported was five nanometer pattern by e-beam lithography. Um, so this is, this is almost, uh, a question, if you just ask people what's your lateral resolution, I can easily say whatever you can pattern, I can transfer that faithfully. But the tricky part here is how deep. If you etch really deep, would you have lateral etching, which is unintended because of the chemical nature. That depends on the material. Yeah, so I want to, you know, deliver this special certification to you, Professor Xiu Ling Li. We are so happy, you know, to hear your latest results, so many amazing works. And uh, yeah, it is really, really helpful and it is really, you know, a good study kind of materials for everyone. Xiu Ling, that's for you. Okay, I can act the Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. Uh, Chen Jiang, thank you very much too. I know, yeah, you are very, very happy with this recorder because you will get it on the stage next month. Yeah, so next month you will be showed up on the stage to deliver the talks at the Young Scientist Lectures, the Mind Day. So we will have it on June 5th. So we choose four leading, you know, young scientists to you know get on the stage they from all over the world Chen Jiang already here everyone see him and you will listen to his talk he did many amazing things Anderson was from Hong Kong University is a young you know faculty but it doing a lot of nice work like music you know for placing for the nanomaterials and Hou Xu from Xiamen University yeah he's doing magic work to get the tunable gate you know put the liquid and all these things you know can be as tunable as the gate Xie Xi is from uh, uh, Guangzhou you know he's doing a lot of work related with the biomedical so he's going to tell us the stories about how how to make all these things to help for this kind of you know special verses recently. So all these four young scientists will get on the stage next month. So everyone looking for that. Chen Jiang today is a big demo here already. So Chen Jiang, we're looking forward to your talk. Okay. Yeah. So months later, prepared, we will breaking recorders again. Maybe millions. <laughs> 
right? Yeah, I think you want to talk to millions, you know, young generations. How excited you? Okay, yeah, go back to prepare your slides and prepare many new things, okay? Yeah, so that's uh, the first advertisement, then the second is for the writing stars in next month too, uh, we have uh, three young scientists that was selected by ACS Nano Editorial Board. So named as Rising Stars, the first, you know, three. Uh, Meso Kim was from Korea. So this young beauty, you know, is doing a lot of nice works for energy harvesting. And Wei Gao was uh, um, from Caltech, and now he's a really, really, really a new star in the academic field. Yeah, he's won a lot of awards, so he's very young. Nan Xu was from uh, uh, Texas, so he's doing a lot of work, like electrical tattoo. So uh, it's very fun, and he's a super speaker, so you love her speaker, the speech. So I think in next uh, uh, months, we have these two uh, special sessions for the young generations. As you know, every uh, way I will advertise this because uh, I, I can, you know, uh, X Tux is a big stage for the young generation too. We invite the top scientists from the whole world. Uh, like today, you know, both of them doing so well, Nick and uh, uh, Xu Lin. Uh, we also, you know, want to promote the young generations. The two sessions the next month come out is we already selected. But if you are young scientists, you want to join us, please join, you know, to get this, you know, Young Scientist Award, the Mind 2020. Uh, submit your materials and get all this information sent in to us. We'll get it, you know, uh, more candidates. We will make it more fun for the young generations. So, yeah, uh, send your materials submit your materials and uh, uh, the last day of this deadline is June 1st so remember uh, in your mind and keep okay uh, your work uh, materials and send it to us as soon as possible and uh, that's our IKX talks you know all the speakers till now we have uh, dozens so all these uh, scientists will get on the stage uh, week by week. It's every Friday we have them. So see all of these lovely faces, and they are superstars in science and technology. Uh, many people send a message to me and from the world. They say, okay, I can ask Cox, it's such a good platform. Yes, it is. We want to make science as a fashion. You know, in this society, we want to make these super scientists to be the superstars because they are doing the work, changing the world. So we keep on going for all these things, days by days, weeks by weeks. Uh, every Friday, I met you on this ITX Talks. So every Friday, remember, Beijing time, uh, 8 p.m. And uh, New York time is 8 a.m. And uh, if you are in Europe, in London, that will be in the afternoon. So that's all the good time you get online to listen to these talks. So I can ask the talk is really try our best to connect the world and the universe, to make science and technologies as a leading fashions. So yeah, keep on going and uh, we have uh, tomorrow another show online as we will get this kick off this opening ceremony for ICANN 2020. This was an event I was rising for 14 years, you know, since 2007. Uh, it's one uh, contest for the innovations. So this year will be the 14 years. So if you are interested, tomorrow you join our opening ceremony online and at 8 o'clock p.m. You know, we will get more fun and more young generation students and to show what's innovations going on. So that's tomorrow. Yeah, we have ICANN 2020, the opening ceremony online. So be sure, you know, to scan the code and to join us. And uh, next Friday, so going to be the end. It's next Friday. Next Friday, our ICANX talk got two, you know, big names. First is Zhi Gangsuo, was from Harvard University. He's a very well-known scientist. He did so many nice things. He was famous for a long, long time. But uh, his 
very active and he is a super speaker. I guarantee I heard his talk, you know, I heard a lot of people talk about his talk. It's really, really fantastic talk, fantastic work. So join us for Zhigang's talk. The second speaker is Joe uh, Jorgen Bruger. He's from EPFL. He's doing a lot of nice work, you know, yeah. When the space shuttles carry out his development, go to the Mars. So as his job, He's a super scientist, a super speaker, and a very interesting person. So next week we have these two speakers. We have a one famous uh, scientist from Japan, awesome Tabata, will be our guest host. He will be introduced something, you know, uh, for from Japan. I think uh, we all love uh, this IKX talks. We all connect on this, you know, plant, uh, universe plant. Yeah, we try our best to get all these things on. If you didn't get uh, listen, how, uh, go through all this lively talk, don't worry about it. We put the replay on this website too, talks.ikx.com. So be sure to join us every Friday. 8 p.m. Beijing time, 8 a.m. New York time, and 1 p.m. London time. So that's the stage for the science and technology. That's the stage for the future. So I can ask talks. See you next Friday. Bye.